Good evening. Welcome to our evening. I'm looking a little bit into uh, looking at media literacy skills. And my name is Diana Montague, I'm a professor of communication at the University of Finley. And I am delighted that Holly invited me to speak here this evening. The last time I was in this, this room was for an instant pot presentation. It was great. Sorry I didn't bring any food, guys. Uh, check out the instant pot. So, as been advertised, we are looking at fighting fake news. It's a term that's been thrown around and misused for, for several years now. And in fact, the first thing that I want to fight tonight is the term fake news. That's an oxymoron. If it is fake information, it is not news. So regardless of people are saying it's fake news if they, uh, if they disagree with it, or uh, fake news if, well, let's look for some better words. Maybe that will, will help us here to be able to use. Misinformation and disinformation will help us better describe some of the the information that falls under that cultural umbrella of fake news. So misinformation is information that is perhaps inaccurate. It may be lacking in context. It may have holes in it. There may be legitimate mistakes in it. And so the audience is somehow doesn't get the correct message. So that is misinformation. Happens a lot. It doesn't mean it's intentional, but we get a message, and if it's not complete, we get the wrong message. That's not fake news, it's been misinformation. Disinformation is misinformation that is intentionally deceiving. And so they intentionally put in errors, or leave out context, or skew things, or adjust things, or edit things, or Photoshop things. That's disinformation. And that's where we have a major problem in our culture, is disinformation. And it's not just American culture, it's a worldwide culture. Disinformation is, is a problem. Not that disinformation is good, but disinformation, because it is intentional, because people are being deceptive, and people are falling for it, that's our problem. So, technology and the, the quickly shifting technology has allowed for huge amounts of disinformation. So just a, a quick little quiz, fast quiz here, which face is real and which is created by a computer? Can you tell immediately by looking at it? The left face is real? No, actually the left face is, is created by a computer. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it's hard to tell, isn't it? It's Both. more vivid, it seems. It, it is. The colors are more vivid. Mm -hmm. And the computer systems recognize that. It, it's a little hard to tell there, but some of her little hairs aren't coming out of her top of her head. They're kind of coming out of her forehead. And her hands a little bit um, misshapen here. Uh, the, the background's kind of blurred. There's a program called StyleGAN. It has an algorithm. And what it does is it allows computers to create these synthetic images of people who never existed. Mm -hmm. There's a website, thispersondoesnotexist.com, very creatively named, and it's a demonstration of how this algorithm works. It posts a new fake image, artificial image, synthetic image, every two seconds. If you go to this and you keep hitting refresh, these pictures of all these different people come in, but you can see little, if you know what to look for, there's little bubbles or there's a little, little things that just aren't right, but you can't tell from an immediate look. So this technology is out there. Seeing is not believing. It's an old phrase. With new technology, it just, it just isn't true. So, <laughs> if seeing isn't believing, what can we do? The goal is to develop media literacy skills. We were taught to read when we go to school. We were taught to read papers and books, but media has expanded since then. And because there is so much misinformation and disinformation out there, we need to be very aware of what to look for to make sure the information that we are consuming is accurate, is fair. 
Media literacy is so important, the New Literacy Project, a national organization, has claimed next week National News Literacy Week. They work in conjunction with a good number of schools, and they've developed programs for teaching children media literacy techniques. They have a, a very inexpensive program for the classrooms called Checkology, and it, it's uh, within school's lesson plans that they can examine news and examine opinion and examine photos to determine what is, is valid and, and what isn't. So why do we need to develop media literacy skills? It is important to know the difference between fact and falsehood. We can be much more productive citizens if we know how to sift through information and find what is accurate. Being media literacy isn't just about the message itself, it's also about understanding the technology that delivers the message <laughs> to us and how that actually impacts the message. And another good reason to develop media literacy skills is to protect ourselves from evildoers. There's a lot of creeps out there, for lack of a better word, who want to get our identity, our money, our vote, uh, and, and it's, it's very surreptitious. So media literacy skills can help us try to avoid some of that. So the key to media literacy, and there's, it's not an easy thing, but the key is to pay attention. Mm -hmm. To pay attention to the content and to try to determine its truthfulness. The, the sheet that I handed out there has uh, several different places that you can check facts. And I'm going to show you a couple of those as we go on this evening to examine what and who the source is and what the authority is. Part of the problem out there is people find something that's either cute or matches their beliefs and they haven't checked it, don't know where it came from, and zip, 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 share, 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 and it's inaccurate, it's come from a false source, you now have your name hooked up to a, an organization that you really don't want your name hooked up to. Pay attention to the delivery method. Did it come from social media? Did it come from legacy media? How reliable is it? And who is the intended audience? And who is the intended audience? There's also a good deal of bias out there. We know this. Bias exists. So if we can identify it, that helps us as we evaluate media. So can we distinguish truth from lies? Can we tell the difference between real and fake? Those photos to show us how difficult it is. Can we distinguish opinion from fact? Both are valid types of communication. But we need to know the difference between something being presented as fact and something being presented as opinion. And that blurs a lot these days. Can we distinguish important from trivial? Please tell me why cat videos get millions of, of, of shares, and important news doesn't get out there. So can we distinguish those? That's the question and challenge. This is me pondering media literacy skills, because just when you think you have it down, something changes, technology changes. Somebody else finds another way to, to uh, infiltrate good information. We live in anxious times. We are surrounded by, by information that, that concerns us. So media literacy is particularly important. So how do we, and, and literacy is, is being able to not just read the words, but being able to critically analyze the contents. So what I'd like to do this evening is I'd like to cover just a little bit of very brief history of some key media events and some advancements. And it, it goes back a lot of years. I promise it won't take too long. But, but recognizing the history of where some of media came from sets the context of media literacy today. Are we using old thought patterns on new media? That doesn't always work when you're trying to find um, truth. I want to look at technology's impact on media literacy and technology's impact on our privacy. It goes hand in hand. And 
And then I'd like to show you some tools that can help us improve media literacy skills and hopefully better protect our privacy. You have a, a sheet. Um, some of those I will, I will go over here, but that you can take with you if, if you want to talk about later. I'm in home computers. So here's a key principle that we can, I want to use to trace through not only some of the history of the media, but to where messages are today. Whoever controls the message holds power. So whoever has information, information is power. So, so I have to go back 550, 560 years. The printing press, this is our first internet. The printing press designed by Johann Gutenberg, the movable press, movable type printing press, he designed it back in the 1440s to make beautiful Bibles. And uh, a couple still exist today, but the purpose there certainly was to, to put together um, this important information, but not quite the same as what, what newspapers do. So once the printing press began to be used for newspapers, here you have power in information. So this is uh, U.S. press. In the late 1700s, the colonial press was a partisan press. There were two types of early American newspapers. One was partisan, and this was the political force. The power people who are educated and are in politics, they had money, they paid for the paper. And so the party itself supported the paper. So of course, party line news was in it. The other uh, main type of, of press at the time was a mercantile press, and so the other source of power, those with money, and were in businesses. And so you had either a political press, funded by the politicians, or a, a business press, a mercantile press, funded by the business folks who wanted to know the shipping routes and uh, so, so for money. So you're, it's an elite form of press, your elite audience. Several decades later, as compulsory education is coming into place, in the early 1800s, you had to go to school until you were in third grade. And so people started to know how to read. It's also the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And so people are starting to go work in factories. And you have to know how to read, in some cases, in the factories to know how to put, uh, process orders. You have some money. You can buy newspapers. But those folks didn't want to read about the politics or the, the shipping at the time, they wanted to read about things that were closer to, um, they found interesting. So in 1833, we had the beginning of what was called the penny press era. And newspapers, which had been six cents, I know, a great bargain by today's standards, six cents dropped down to a penny. So just the percentage there is significant. And the content was about police stories and uh, feature stories and what's going on in the neighborhoods. And the way they funded it, and they lost all that money from selling per paper, was through selling ads. And so we can trace when newspapers actually made good money from ads back to the penny press era. That has since dropped off significantly in the last 15 years. But so we can trace it back here. So we have a different audience here. Different message. Still a sense of who controls the power. Editors, publishers. The clash of the, the yellow journalists, the sensationalists, who make all kinds of crap up, goes back to the Joseph Pulitzer, William Randolph Hearst era in the late 19th century. And, and Pulitzer eventually cleaned up his act and, and went for more truthful information. Our Pulitzer Awards are named after him, they were endowed by him. But you have this, um, this competition of who can make the most sensational newspaper. And so when you have the little newsies, who who's can sell the most? And at the, at the turn of the century, it, uh, I believe, and Sarah, you may know this better than I, at the time, I think there was like 11 newspapers at one time in the city of Finley, daily and weekly, right around, uh, right around 1900. There were I don't know how many, but several. So it, so it was a great deal where people had, had choice. Now remember, this is the only medium going here. TV, uh, no radio, no internet, and so newspapers were the way of the power of information. That's, that's how people were informed. 
serious, objective journalism comes more to play in the late 19th century. James Gordon Bennett, of course, Greeley, other key editors who really put money into good, solid news coverage. And so by 1900, you, you do have some decent journalism out there. There's the great lady in 1900, the New York Times. But there was something else going on, not mutually exclusive of media development. But there's something going on in, in culture, particularly American culture here. Because of the Industrial Revolution, we are moving from an agrarian culture, on the whole, to an industrialized. I mean, there's still, still farms, but we are shifting to where the major source of, of production comes from. So from farming, controlling, and, and how does how is time controlled for farmers by, by the sun and the rain and the seasons, right? So that's a different type of controlling than when people would go off to, to the factories. Completely different sense of who has control over your time. And this made people anxious. This made people anxious. So when you've got this, and I, and I bring this up because I'm going to Bring the concept back up in a little bit. When major cultural shifts happen, people get anxious, and that comes out in, in sometimes in not so positive ways. <coughs> so, the film industry was coming into play this time too, the early 19th, uh, early 20th century. But that was entertainment that people had to go out of their homes to get. You went down to the neighborhood theater and you would watch the films. Radio was developed <coughs> excuse me, in the early 20th century and was in many homes, particularly uh, during the Depression. And radio, if you can see here, was furniture, not just noise. Radio brought entertainment, it brought news, people moved their furniture around it. It was the focal point in their family room. They, they trusted what came out of that box. Trusted it. Well, then at the end of the near the end of the depression, uh, we have uh, Orson Welles, who was at, at the time he was a struggling artist, and on a Sunday afternoon he did a radio program, a radio rendition of H. G. Wells' *War of the Worlds*, a novel that had come out 35 years before, 40 years before, and he timed it. So that when he made it sound like a newscast, that the aliens were coming, and he would break into the music. And he timed it so that when the other channels, like Charlie McCarthy were on, when they went to commercial break, and people were moving the dial, they would come back to him, and this is when he would have these fake news reports. Well, he didn't say they were fake. At the beginning of the presentation, he said, no, we will have the War of the Worlds. And so he introduced it as a theater, but he never stopped in the middle. So people, as you see here, not everybody, but some people were duped. They thought it was real. Telephone lines got shut down. Uh, Mr. Paley came running down in the middle of the night to tell him to stop, and, and he wouldn't stop. And so the next day in the newscast, they're like, did you know that people were panicking over this? And I know. I have no idea. How could people not know the great work of H.G. Wells? So basically, he was dissing his audience and lying through his teeth. He got a movie contract after that. Laws went into effect that you couldn't have fake newscasts out. So this trust in radio is broken. Along comes the TV. Not quite what we have today, but as the TV after World War II into the 50s, they came into the homes, uh, no longer a luxury. Pretty much almost every home had one. And again, we trusted what came from that screen. Seeing is believing. And then the quiz show scandals. In the mid to late 1950s, some of the quiz shows to get better ratings, to get more viewers, they uh, kind of spiked the answers. Good documentaries out on this and actually what happened. But quiz show winners were rock stars. They were the athletes of like today. They were on, on television shows and they threw out the first pitch and, and they were on news shows. 
And then when it was found out that some of them were cheating, then faith in television went away. So we give our trust to something often until it's violated. How can you trust television? So, the beginning of the internet, I'm jumping a lot of you, I know this. The internet started, we've had computers for some years, uh, very large computers. The internet started basically in the 1960s, and it started with the government linking its computers around the United States so that they could pass information along from point to point. And so, kind of like the interstate, but for information. And the theory there was if uh, in the Cold War, somebody took out one site, they wanted to be able to access information from others. And then educational institutions got in on it as well. 30 years later, Tim Berners-Lee invents the World Wide Web. We don't know if we should praise him or curse him for that, but he was one who invented the World Wide Web. And then the next year, the web goes commercial. Before 1992, you couldn't have an ad on a computer, on a web. That is just mind-blowing today, because you can't get away from ads now. But it was, it was at one time not commercial. So 10 years after it goes commercial, social media is born. MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. All within about eight years. Not how many hundreds of years with the printing press. It happened so fast. So fast. That's part of the scary part, it's not bad for them. So now we have a shift in the control of the cultural narrative. Who has the message? Who has the power? Those who have be been consumers of the messages have now become publishers. So the newspapers, editors and publishers, they were gatekeepers. Most of them were trained well to be able to filter through information to go out. Same in television news and radio news. Now the people who consumed it, they just put stuff out. There are more voices now, which we can see some value in, less concentrated power, but the question becomes, whose voices should we listen to? You may have heard the phrase, the theatrical phrase, all the world's a stage. Now all the world's on stage. Anybody who has a little computer, phones or computers, can get on stage and put out a message. The audience members have become the actors, and they can jump on and off stage anytime they want. It doesn't matter who's talking, they can jump in. It's kind of chaotic. So if all the world's on stage, how do we make sense of this? Technology certainly has allowed that to happen. So is technology our hero? <coughs> is technology our villain? And it really isn't that simplistic. You know, if we think of what we do, today with, with our phones, with our computers, that we, we just couldn't live without what we did before. But there's also a cost to that. There's some other things that go on with technology that uh, we pay a price for. So how has technology impacted some of our media literacy skills? Well, new technology has changed where and how we get our information. You may still go to your doorstep in the morning and get a morning paper. I hope you do. But that's not the only place anymore. You may still watch evening news on television, but that's not the only place anymore. So it's changed how and where we get our information. So technology can fix some problems, but it also tends to generate more. And what happens often is people learn to misuse technology <laughs> But before it's used for good. So, I come back to my cultural shift in the idea of how do we feel about time and controlling our own lives. The time shift there from an agrarian sense to an industrial sense, we have another time shift going on now. And often we can't see it because we're in it, kind of like the fish in the water. The time shift, the news. Cycle. used to be like on a 24-hour period, 
If you worked for a newspaper, you had one deadline, and then you had no time for the next day to go check out your stories. See, even with, with television news, there were specific deadlines. Now there's a perpetual news cycle. You still get maybe one newspaper in a day, or you get like one six o'clock news pass, but the news cycle is ongoing. It never stops. This is uh, provided a problem of speed versus accuracy. So, you know, we always wanted to scoop, get the scoop, be the first one to get the story. But at the cost now of accuracy, this has become a problem. People don't take the time to double check their information and their sources. And again, journalists make mistakes. Any good journalist never makes an intentional mistake. Correct it, but if you have less time, you can see where more mistakes are made. This other time shift gives us too much information. How do I know when I'm done reading the news? It used to be when I got through the whole newspaper. Now I keep waiting for, for feeds, Twitter feeds. What else is new? What else is new? How did anybody get any work done? What else is new? This causes some anxiety. What am I going to miss? So this time shift gives us another sense of cultural anxiety. There's so much out there. I'm just in the, I'm engulfed, and it's very difficult to pick out what I should be paying attention to. Another thing that's, that's shifted because of technology, the idea of having content at our fingertips that we can watch when we want it, so we don't share that same time frame with somebody else. There's no such thing as shared water cooler talk anymore. Nobody watches the same, the same thing at the same time. So we control what we want to watch when we want to watch it. But think about what that does for us if we spend a whole day on Netflix, which isn't too hard to do, we watch the whole season. It, it changes our sense of, of time. It changes our sense of cultural narrative. So some other things that contribute to the literacy challenges. We have so much information, it's hard to determine what's reliable versus what has been fabricated. Not all information is created equal, but some information is given uh, lots more time and space, regardless of, of, its, of its value. And new technologies make it easy to spread misinformation or disinformation that looks like it's from an authoritative source. And this is quite important. We, it, Make sure you check your URLs because it, it, it may look like it's coming from a reputable place, but those can be fake pretty easily. We have uh, the middle here, news aggregators. News aggregators are they're, they're kind of like hubs that uh, some examples are Huffington Post and Drudge Report, where they will pull stories off the internet or links to stories that they think their readers will want to read. And so they're kind of being the gatekeeper for that. And this, of course, pulls some ad money away from online publications. News aggregators make money without creating the news themselves. Uh, but it, it gives us the feeling that, oh, I know all the news now because I just looked at my one news aggregator. So that, too, can be dangerous. So, um, one of the challenges we have is, is, again, being able to distinguish that which is news and that which is some other information. So if it looks like news and facts like news, is it news? Not always. Not all talking heads who sit at a desk are news. They may have the conventions of a newsroom. It looks like a newsroom. But they're commenting on news. They're not delivering news. They are entertainers. Their content of entertainment is what's in the news. But they are not news. Sometimes opinions are presented as fact. And you've got so many 24-7 channels on, on, on our on cable, on television, online, that they're filling it with stuff. And opinions, again, are great. But when people are taking them or they're being presented as fact, that's the challenge. And another challenge we have is we're surrounded by all this information is that many people listen to commentary on news, which, which is fine, but they never read or hear the actual news 
first. So they're getting a couple generations of somebody's opinion about the news without getting the news. And so that is a, it's a challenge to media literacy. The internet, and particularly social media, they make it easy, too easy, to select only the information that already supports what we already believe. We don't ever get challenged. This is called confirmation bias, and this goes on very frequently. We only associate ourselves with information that we already agree with. It's, it's kind of it's natural, actually. I mean, who wants to be told they're wrong? Whoever wants to question your own beliefs. So we have cognitive dissonance that may not be right. That's called confirmation bias, where we only pay attention to that which already supports our existing beliefs. So if we surround ourselves only with information we agree with, that builds that confirmation bias. Especially if we spend half the day around information. We think we're very informed, but this is what's going on here. Confirmation bias can impact what we choose to share on the internet. See this video will play here. Uh, this is yeah, CBS News. This was last fall. There was a, a video of um, Speaker Pelosi that was edited. And it was a really, it wasn't a high-tech edit job. I mean, anybody with a computer could have done this. And um, what happened was the altered video got shared on social media millions of times. And uh, people thought it was, was real. So this is a short, short news report on that, that video. This was from CBS this morning. by slowing down the video, very simple technique in video production, it made Speaker Pelosi sound like she was drunk. <laughs> and it got spread and spread. And so this is, this is the information that, that goes out there. <coughs> so, we didn't get to see the whole thing, but it talked about um, who spread the video, did confirmation bias contribute to that mass distribution of the fake Pelosi video? There's a lot of people who, who don't like her. And so when they saw this, did they spread it because, oh, here, this makes her look really stupid. I'll pass it along. Um, Facebook had the video up and even after they found out it was false, wouldn't take it down. Is Facebook responsible then for any reputational harm? So, and there's a whole thing on, on libel. She would have been a suit to the public figure. But the idea that if, you, if there's something legitimately inaccurate, should the site take it down? Facebook is not going to take down political ads that have direct lies in them. <laughs> Zuckerberg came out and said, not my, not my place. People can make their, their decisions. That should frighten everybody. Because uh, it's people believe lies. And it's not just political campaigns that are doing it. This is where you can see potential Russian interference. They buy ads. And their ads don't say, comrade, don't vote for Hillary. They don't look like Russian ads. They look like they look like other ads that we see in other places. I have to wrap a minute. Pardon? Can I have sure. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to should a person who runs Facebook be the decision maker as to what's the truth and what isn't? And that's a good question. Who makes the decision? But once something is found to be a lie, it's found to be altered so that it's in, in 
and what would this, how would the person that runs this find the source uh, to know it's a lie? I mean, when right, we, right. So Zuckerberg has enough people working for him that, um, and people report things, it, it, it um, can be found out. Would he have to actually contact Mrs. Mrs. Pelosi to find out that it was a fake one? Or? No, and she didn't have anything to do with that one. There were other news sources that had the original, so she oh, was I able. See. Yeah, so she was able to find that. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure, I'm, I'm struggling here. but some of technology is. We teach our children, don't take candy from strangers. Don't talk to strangers. <laughs> what do we take off the internet? Do we know who it comes from? Ooh, sweet. <laughs> I'm going to share it. I'm going to like it. Every time we like or share something, we are connected something else. Whoever put that up there, and not your original aunt, and I've got someone over here with my aunt, uh, it gets connected farther than that. And we, we trust what's on the internet too much. We just, we have to be very careful. Stranger danger is something we should all pra practice. We don't take candy from strangers. We don't take sweet little memes from them either. Deception should make us more wary than we are. You've heard the stories of the Nigerian prince email scams. I have millions of dollars for you. All you have to do is send me a check for 300 so I can transfer it to your bank account. Lottery winnings guaranteed. Send me a gift card for $50 from your local store and I will send you your lottery winnings. Fishing, not the fun kind, but the fish and the worms in the boat. This is where people will send you emails and try to get into your banking account information or your other identity and they look a lot like your bank account. Clickbait. These are these ads that, that look really kind of enticing. Ooh, I want to learn about that. Seven cars so good it's hard to believe they cost under $20,000. Don't click, please. You're never going to find a, a good car there. That's not what it, it It drags you into the advertisers have you. They plant cookies in your computer so they can follow you. They know what you're interested in. Here's the one I was talking about. Um, my aunt, God love her, put this up on, on Facebook. And this is criticizing those in, in Congress. As long as they can get a lifelong pension of $110,000, $174,000 a year, they don't care if they get fired. Time to set term limits of two and only a six month pension of 25% of their present pay level at removal. Then they need to find a job like their bosses, we the people do. Share if you, if you agree. <laughs> Get those people yeah. out of Congress, right? Fine if you believe that. Don't share that. Don't share that. Share if you agree. What's that going to get? It's not going to change Congress. It's going to connect you, though, to an organization you probably don't want to be connected to, even if you believe those, uh, th those very pieces of information. This is America's Freedom Fighters. Sounds so patriotic. It's an inflammatory clickbait website, a very hard right slant. Media bias fact check calls them a questionable source. It's been over the top right wing bias and publishes conspiracy theories, and it's not always factual. So, regardless of what your political leanings are, this is dangerous stuff to share. It hooks you up to things you, you can't even see behind, uh, behind the scenes. So, stranger danger. 
you don't know it, don't touch it. The online fun quiz that we like to take, if you've got friends on Facebook, please copy and paste this and fill this in so we have some fun. What's your favorite food? What, um, what month were you born? What's your favorite color? What, um, what's the name of the street that you lived on when you were a child? Innocuous? Think about some of the passwords you have to set up, like your double check passwords. You know, you've got your, your main one. But my bank makes you do a second one. What's one of the questions? What's your favorite food? What city were you born in? So stuff like this gets collected. I know we all think that, you know, it, it must be has all kinds of these set up. We give up private information that can help hackers. Don't do it. Have a tea party. Talk about it. But don't post it online. And if you go on social media, your best bet is to go in thinking, I have no privacy. You won't be disappointed. Mm -hmm. So anything that you share or like puts a trail of information connected back to you. Chemical chain letters. Um, some may be innocuous, but some is, is very insidious. Um, this, and, and here's an example of this wasn't insidious. It, it was just. Uh, AEP gave the University of Finley $500,000 in scholarships. Incredible. The AEP put this on Twitter. Of course I like it. I'm from the University of Finley. Anybody who gives us money, I'm delighted, right? So I, I click like. I check LinkedIn. Who's been checking out my profile? AEP. How do they know that? You can go in and see who liked your stuff. You can go in and see who shares your stuff. So know that. And I think we're doing the any harm, but, but that just reminded me I have to think before I like or before I share. Cookies are in your computer. How do you know how many cookies? Get one of the C Cleaner computer programs to get rid of all of them. And these are little bits of information that follow where you go. Or they can fill in your name when you're filling out forms. Oh, thank you for helping me. <laughs> you're giving away information. When you search on Google, you're, you're readjusting the algorithms for your next search. It kind of like learns what you like, and so it changes. So if we each got our own home computers out here, we searched for the same thing on Google, different things would come up because we had set the algorithms differently. This was in uh, the, the cartoons, um, and it was in the Courier a couple weeks ago. Zips is the life of teenage Jeremy here. His friend says, then he said he accepted my paper anyway, quote, warts and all, unquote. Ha ha, warts and all, said Jeremy. Ping goes his phone. Here's what I found for warts and all, says his phone. And his friend says, your targeted display ads are going to suck for a while, knock it off algorithms. And he's getting all these wart cream commercials because his phone heard him say warts and all. The next day, what's all this? Just some stupid targeted advertising. Some algorithm heard me say warts, and now I see ads about them everywhere. And you see that on your computers too. You order something, all of a sudden all the ads on your computer are, are, are from the, for that very product or that company. Uh, you just said it again. Okay, here's more results for Cure My Warts. So he's upset. The last one, all these ads he's getting, and his parents are going, hmm, and they see what's on his computer. And they say, is there something you want to tell us about, Jim? It's not me, it's the algorithm. So just something as innocuous as a phrase you're using. If it gets picked up by your phone, by what you type in, by your little Alexa, it can, um, it makes connections. So how does this all tie together? History and technology have changed so quickly. Media literacy skills have gotten much more difficult to develop. It's a challenge. Technology, while it can be very helpful, is not always our friend. We need to be wary. And we have no privacy if we're online. Just need to come to that understanding. So, I'm back in my corner. <laughs> but there is hope. We can sharpen our media literacy skills. These are not toys. Social media are not toys. They are tools. Don't get your news off of Facebook, please. There are many other good sources. Don't get, get pictures of your grandchildren there, but don't get your news there.
part of understanding improving media literacy also helps us if we understand what journalism is. We need to recognize the difference between journalism and other kinds of information. Big difference. Journalists and other information purveyors. They have different purposes. They have different training. Recognize the difference between fact and opinion. And again, it doesn't mean that one or the other opinion is bad, but we need to be able to distinguish the two. There's a difference between asserting something and verifying it. There's a difference between providing evidence or just inference. And we need to be critical thinkers for that. There is media bias out there. We acknowledge that. We understand that. There's also audience bias. Okay. So sometimes acknowledging what exists out there and not going la 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 can help us in media literacy skills. Just a couple of media sources with minimal bias in the news. Now, things have opinion sections. The British Broadcasting Company, National Public Radio, American Public Media, Reuters, Associated Press. Their news is fairly unbiased. Okay, so if you're looking for decent sources, read more than the headline. When was it published? Sometimes people will post stuff and like it happened today and it happened in 2001. <coughs> Consider the source. Is it a website? Who is the author? is who was quoted in there. Are there supporting sources? If your only source is, set a source close to the White House, that could be somebody who cleans the floor. You don't know. Is there a label of news or opinion? Perspective, critique, those are opinions. Again, as long as we know what we're looking at. Is it intended to be funny or satire? That may make a difference in how we perceive. So here's a couple of tools for our toolbox. Um, Mike Caulfield, he's a, an online purveyor of digital media literacy. His approach to evaluating the web is, is a to-do approach. How, what do I do? What are my steps? He puts it into the word sift. Stop. When you see something, do you know the website? Do you know the source of the information? If not, investigate the source. Find trusted coverage. You can find the same information if, it, if it's true elsewhere. And then trace claims, quotes, and media back to their original context. It takes work. Media literacy is not easy. But this is how we can become more media literate citizens. This is a really cool app on your phone or your, your, uh, your tablet. And I have a, a little bit of direction on the sheet there. Informable, brand new. It came out from the News Literacy Project. And you can just you go to your app store and you type in Informable. And you can uh, test yourself. There is easy and, and um, intermediate and uh, brilliant, whatever the level it is there. You can, it gives you a series of things. Is this an ad or not? There's a category of is this evidence or not? Is this news or opinion? Is this a checkable? assumption or checkable statement or is it not and so you can kind of test yourself and it's, it's, it's a fun little uh, fun little thing where we think we can distinguish everything so try that one out as we are in the election season it seems like we've always been in the election season but PolitiFact is a good place to check political claims and, and facts and there's a the URL for that is on there as well Factscheck.org is a large site. It checks multiple things. Um, it, there's just a picture here of the last Democratic presidential debate, and so they fact check the claims that go on in, in that debate. But um, it's, it's a good place to go check things if you're not sure if they're accurate. Snopes.com checks uh, facts, news, videos. It can be reverse images. Here's a picture. One of the places you can check pictures is on Google Reverse Images. It's a great place. You can put the picture in itself or a URL and it will check where its origin is. Really? Oh, how do you, I, don't, I know there's images at the top, but how do you get the reverse images? 
what they do is is you can um, when you click into it, it'll ask you if you want to just put in a picture. So if you've got a picture, you can copy it in, or if it's if you have like the URL from the picture, you can put that in too, and it'll be able to find it. Sure. Yeah, but you can put the whole image in, and it'll visually check it. Thank you. I appreciate that sure. information. This uh, picture was was tweeted out by uh, Arizona Representative Paul Gosser some some weeks ago. And uh, this is on the left, um, Iranian President Rouhani and then former President Barack Obama. And uh, said in the tweet, good thing these two people are out of power. Well, uh, these two people never met face to face. And uh, the image of the meeting wasn't altered by representative. He just tweeted it out to his 6,000 followers and they shared it with 3,000 other people. And what it was a fake was from a, a photo from 2011 of President Obama's meeting with former India Prime Minister uh, Manmohan Singh to discuss nuclear abilities. And so here you have, where's my other picture? I have the original, sorry. It's not coming up here. The, they have the actual, the two things that were photoshopped in were just the head of, of the president and the colors of the flag. So, and you can take that image and put it on reverse image, and you can find it. So you can find the original. So you can check these things out before you tweet. Russian trolls, um, they're a very heavy target for them, are veterans. Veterans use social media a great deal, and um, some of the patriotic memes that are put up, uh, when they're, they're liked and they're shared, it, it, it connects them. Again, it doesn't mean that you don't believe these things, it's just you don't know where it came from. And so when uh, the Russian trolls buy hundreds of ads, the algorithm targets people who clicked on other things before. Facebook has a place, and I've got it on that sheet, where you can look at the ads that have been in the past on Facebook. So if you want to investigate, it has that tool. So here are my safety tips. Don't get your news from Facebook. Don't get your politics from Facebook. Don't share or like anything if you don't know the original source. You know, your pictures of your grandkids. Okay. But again, you're putting them up there too. If you can find another way to see photos of your family, do it and get off Facebook. So that's my own opinion there. But there's some evidence here that we're giving away much more than we're getting. If you do stay on Facebook, please set your privacy settings as high as possible. That still doesn't guarantee you'll have complete privacy because if one of your friends doesn't have high privacy, you can give it that one. So, in conclusion, we need to resolve to work to be more media literate, to be more news literate. So, pause before you post. At least check out the facts first. Remember, stranger danger. Don't take the sweet stuff from somebody you don't know. Verify the information in multiple places. We have tools that can do that. Correct misinformation. Do it kindly. We've lost a sense of civility in some, in some senses. So that when everybody is on the stage and they all have, uh, they all have their messages and they all want some of that power, we can help sift through some of those messages to use our media literacy skills. And so we fight misinformation. We fight disinformation. We fight those horrible words. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. We've got a couple minutes left if anybody wants to chat, if anybody wants to ask questions. Yeah. You had mentioned with the ADP example, did you check LinkedIn to see who was following you? Um, who, who had checked? Who had checked? How yeah. did you do that? Is that complicated? Yeah, on, on my LinkedIn account, you can, it, it sends me an email every week that says, your profile has been looked at by 11 people, and I'm putting my own. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, oh, who? And so I, I go click in. And if you pay premium, you can find out it's actually who, but they, they give you the companies. So, and so I can see if other universities or whoever, but that one week, I mean, it wasn't two days after I said, yay, thanks for the scholarship mm -hmm. money. Oh, I said, like. 
did AEP actually give the university? I sure hope so, because we had it in our newsroom. Oh, well, I'm just yes, it's my understanding. I mean, that, it wasn't something that was fake. Oh no, 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 no. It, because the university had first published it, and that that they gave us this money. AEP, AEP then wanted to, of course, <laughs> promote what they good they had done for the community, and I wanted to say, yay AEP. But now AEP is hmm, this money character. Yeah. Okay, so, so they followed up on it. Yeah, yeah, they they followed up on it and. And there are whole jobs out there now following the social media. Again, thank you for coming out. I really appreciate it. I hope you've enjoyed it. But I hope you at least have a couple of tools that can help you sift through some of the junk that's out there, hopefully, to find the difference between the trash and the difference between the treasure. What if somebody authentically makes a statement, but it's a lie? You know what I'm saying? But I'm referring to some of the things being put out by the politicians. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're making a statement right. or something, but who's to determine whether it's a lie or not? I mean, you mentioned that Facebook. That right. Um, part of that depends on, on what actually is said. Is it something that they can check? If we say the economy is better, well, by what standard? But if we say the gross national product has gone up 1.2%, that you can check. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's some things you can't well, what check. They, what if they lie about their background? There are good fact checkers out there who dig into where people went to school, what they did, where they worked. I mean, it's just like you're checking a, a resume. If, if you embellish your resume, there are people. There are smart people that can track that down. So it, it can be, if it's presented as concrete, right. it can be tracked down. And they'll make that public and they can ban somebody for doing that? They won't ban anybody. Yeah. That's the problem. They won't ban anybody. It's free speech. It's free speech. Yeah. YouTube yeah. asks if you like a video. Is it wrong to say you like a video? I would not say there's anything wrong. People make their money on YouTube videos by how many likes they get yeah. because the advertisers then pay for it. Yeah. So you can do that, but anything that you click online, you, your computer is telling somebody that you clicked on that online. So just be aware that everything we do, right. there's yeah. another life for it. Okay. But I mean, they do give you similar things when you like things. And That's right. And how do they know that? Because you like something. I understand that part, but is it wrong to, I mean, I like the idea they bring up other things, but there's a hundred thousand possibilities, right. you know, and I don't, they do bring up things, so I find the value. So I well, and again, there's the value. So I'm not saying don't do it, but just be aware that when you do do it, this is what happens. And so if you want all those exactly like videos, then you like it, then you'll get them. Mm -hmm. And that's what the technology can provide. Yeah, so it's not, it's not wrong, it's just, know that it connects. Right. Yeah. I, I understand that, but I just want to know how it can be dangerous to you. Um, if, I don't know so much on, on, on YouTube, except uh, whatever advertisers are there, they can see what types of videos you like, yeah. and so then when they put ads out there. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Sure. So. But I was just curious of how it can be dangerous, you know, to like, won't get somebody stalking you or something because I, I don't know that you'll get that from liking a YouTube video, but um, certainly um, identities have been stolen. I'm I, I, I like on Facebook. Yeah, I, I don't know like that. Well, anybody can create a YouTube video. You understand that? Anybody yeah. can put it, yeah. and anybody, yeah. so if so, if somebody puts a YouTube video out there that says uh, says something about something, and then you like it, that person. That there's no journalism responsibility for that. No, so I'm then they can ch they can continue to send you videos yeah. that are similar because anybody can do it. You, no, I can I, make one, you can make one, anybody can do it. And I watch isn't going to hurt anybody. I'm one of those can't be persons. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. You can watch it, and you understand it. That person, if you like it, that person is going to keep sending you similar <laughs> ones or more or more provocative ones mm -hmm. to see if you'll do it. Does YouTube video anybody can produce? Yeah, I understand. What okay, so it's nice because I did all. I figured it's an original, and you know nobody makes it. Sure, they do. 
You can put anything you want on them. Well, I mean, they show pictures of their cute little cat working, playing with a little duck or something. I don't think they think that. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> Absolutely. And anybody can do it. Anybody can do anything. And I've seen cats play with rabbits and, oh, and, and even parakeets. I mean, you know, so to me, I mean, yeah. I kind of think that thinking it would be, I mean, it would be rare, right. you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not saying somebody wouldn't do it. Well, just just so we know that mm -hmm. I can make a picture there. Now, do you really think that Associated Press and those 49 to BBC and so forth mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. reliable sources? Yes. Mm -hmm. What about yes. places like Newsmax? And uh, um, that's your, your news is going to be more skewed there. But do you think it's going to be factual? Not no. necessarily. There, there's some facts in it, but it's it's still going to be skewed. Yeah, I understand they're presenting the other side of what they're, what they're right. Yeah, so I mean, that way, but... Even legitimate sources, like for instance, you take 13 ABC. If you, you watch the television show at 630 on 13 ABC, yeah. if you later on in the evening click on Twitter, and you want to watch what they have on Twitter, it's a completely different news crew that's creating the Twitter than what you saw on TV. So they might have a similar story, but that story is created and written from a different perspective than what you watch on TV. So if you watch the, let's say you watch something on Dr. King that was on 13 ABC, and then and then later on in the evening you see a similar image, you see a similar picture, and it says Dr. King. You click on that. It's written by and produced for and creating a whole different set of of reasons for its existence. Yeah. Do you like work for the courier or anything? No, I'm a teacher. Oh, you're a teacher. Okay, yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, I'm a teacher. Because I wanted I to ask stuff. about the courier yeah. news. Yeah. Now, they have yeah. their own reporters. Can it be yeah. more trusted, do you think, than something that comes off the national network? The courier, um, their, their best coverage is of, of local things. Right, yeah. They also put national things in. Yeah. They get that off the Associated Press wire or Reuters. Yeah, and they usually say where they get it from mm -hmm. the Associated Press mm -hmm. and stuff like that. You mm -hmm. know? But I noticed they also put things up <coughs> that are um, from other newspapers. Mm -hmm. You know? Right. Uh, like, uh, I like to read the, uh, where people write the letters, you know. Right, and, and that's an opinion page. I that needs to be that. really clear. But they bring things in from other newspapers, somebody mm -hmm. else's opinion, and, and mm -hmm. so forth. Like yeah, that. that, that's pretty common. Uh, okay, I'm not that mm -hmm. my own or something. <laughs> well, thank you all. I, thank uh, you. And those of you who want to respect your time, I know it was an hour. Great. If you like to stick around, great. If not, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank Go you. practice this meal. Was very <laughs> Oh, no, no, it's fine. <laughs>